<laughs> Let's turn to our scripture reading. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made men on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the Lord had his blessing to the, his word this morning. Have you found grace. Have you found grace? Frederick Nietzsche told a story of a madman who lit a lamp in the bright morning and went to the marketplace crying ceaselessly, I see God! I see God! There were many among those standing there who didn't believe in God, so he made them laugh. One gentleman said, is God lost? Another one said, has he gone astray like a child? Or perhaps is he hiding? Has he gone on board a ship and emigrated to another planet, another country? They all laughed and shouted at one another. The man sprang into their midst and looked daggers at them and cried out, where is God? I will tell you, we have killed him. You and I, we are his killers. But how have we done this? How could we swallow up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the horizon? What will we do as the earth is set loose from its sun? Nietzsche's point was not that God does not exist, but that God has become irrelevant. Men and women may assert that God exists or that He does not exist, but it matters little. God is dead, not because He does not exist, but because so many live, play, procreate, govern, and die as though he does not exist. This morning I will speak to you on the topic, Have You Found Grace? Let us pray. Father in heaven, I pray that your spirit will take full possession of my lips, of my mind, I pray that Jesus will be lifted up. I pray that hearts will be warmed and fall more in love with Jesus Christ. I pray that you would speak through me and to me. Not by power, nor by might, but by your Spirit, I plead in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you found grace. The period before the flood was known as the antediluvian period. It was a time in earth's history that was marked by brazen idolatry, vice, 
lawlessness, indifference, and yes, atheism. The majority of people lived, played, procreated, and died as though God was a figment of the imagination. Yet they had less of an excuse than men have today. Because they were not very far removed from the actual fall of the first father, Adam, and first mother, Eve. In fact, the pen of inspiration tells us that the Garden of Eden was still visible. And as is said in Genesis, the sword that flashed every way was still visible to all of those who would dare to approach the gates of the Garden of Eden. Yet in spite of all of the proof of the existence of God, man went down a slippery slope and embraced vice and wickedness of all sorts. But praise God, there stood a giant of a man. Not necessarily a giant in stature, but in character. And his name was Noah. Noah. We read, we read in Genesis chapter 6, reading it again, those of you following in your Bibles, follow in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and that they took wives of all which they chose. The text tells us that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, in that there was something about the daughters of men that drew the attention of the sons of God. The Bible tells us, and I quote, that they were fair to look upon. If I were to write my own modern version of the Amplified Bible, perhaps I would put it this way. The sons of God were drawn to the daughters of men because the daughters of men wore many skirts, excessive makeup, revealing skin-tight clothing, and abundance of jewelry. In other words, the daughters of men were really good at advertising themselves. And the sons of God, who originally feared God, fell for the enticements hook, line, and sinker. Furthermore, the account tells us that the sons of God disregarded the advice, disregarded the admonition of their parents, and took wives of whomever they wished. In Bible times, it is understood that it was almost a crime, it was a sin for children to disregard the advice of their parents in regards to whom they should marry. But the sons of God disregarded what their parents had to say and they went after these strange women who had nothing to do with God. In fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 6, if you look throughout the whole Genesis account of the period before the flood, you will not see any term, daughters of God. All we see is daughters of men. As if to suggest that the daughters of God, who were no doubt there, there are always daughters of God. As if to suggest that the daughters of God were simply ignored by the sons of God. They were irrelevant. They weren't event adventurous enough. They weren't exciting. So they were drawn to the daughters of men. But Genesis chapter 6 verse 8 tells us, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Continuing at verse 3 of Genesis chapter 6, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. 
There were giants in the earth in those days. Also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. As a result of these tumultuous, unhappy relationships between the sons of God, men who originally feared God, and women who did not fear God, children were born who were insecure as a result of the strife that was in the home. Verse 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <clears throat> you see, as a result of the sons of God marrying the daughters of men, conditions on the earth got worse. To the extent that the thoughts of the hearts of men was only evil continually. And these children that were born out of these dysfunctional families, normally children, when they are in a functional home, we are, when they are in a healthy home, they draw their identity, they draw their worth from their parents. <clears throat> but when children come from a dysfunctional home, they do not draw their identity and their worth from their parents, they draw it from what they can do. They draw it from what they can accomplish. I am worth something because of what I can do. I am worth something. I am special because of my strength, because of my stature. And this is exactly what happened during these times. Men were born, and the Bible says that many of them were giants, and they no longer viewed their identity as from their parents, but they said, I am special, I am special because of my strength and stature, and the more I can take from people, the more I can conquer. This is what gives me value. <clears throat> Verse 11 tells us, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. These men of renown, these giants, use their superior strength and stature to terrorize people and take whatever they want. And if they couldn't get it without someone surrendering it, they would take it by force. But verse 8 tells us, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved them at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man, whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. Now God was not fed up, as though he had made an error in making man. No, for the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie neither the Son of Man, that he should repent. God does not make mistakes. No, the words repented must be harmonized with the words grieved for us to really understand what the writer of Genesis, Moses, was drawing at. It says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And so by harmonizing these words, this is an important principle in understanding Scripture. We must weigh all words. We must take all words of the Bible, all words in a text into consideration before we come away with the meaning of a text. And by harmonizing these words, we see that God did not make a mistake. No, God was deeply grieved. God was hurt. God was deeply saddened by the course that humanity had taken. He saw that humanity was just miserable. And those who were miserable were just making others more and more miserable. It was as if the entire human race were afflicted with AIDS or some sort of terminal disease. And it was in the best interest of them to be wiped out. But Noah 
found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6 verse 9 tells us, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. In the midst of a corrupt generation, Noah found grace, which resulted in him standing out as a rare beacon of light in a very, very dark period of Earth's history. So this morning, rather it's afternoon, it's 12 o'clock right now, we're going to briefly look at the character traits of Noah to understand what it means to find grace. What it means to find grace. How did Noah demonstrate that he found grace? And by looking at these character traits, it is my prayer that these character traits will be our priority. Acquiring these character traits will be our priority. If we have these character traits, we will ask that the Lord will enhance them so that Christ will be glorified. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect. So the first character trait that we're looking at was the Bible points out that Noah was just and perfect. Those who find grace in the eyes of the Lord are just and perfect individuals. The word just can be translated as righteous. The Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament defines the word just of a thing which is examined and found to be in order just. Juridical, persons whose conduct will be checked and found irreproachable, innocent in the right. Therefore, the Bible tells us, the Bible uses a word that says that Noah was above reproach. And he was above reproach, not in an innocent generation, but he was above reproach in a decrepit, disgusting generation. There was not one person who could point the finger at Noah and accuse him of wrongdoing. He was like Paul, when Paul could boast that he was innocent, he was Innocent before the written law. Noah's conduct was irreproachable. Speaking of the just, the Bible says, He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. In Noah's enterprises, in, in all of his business transactions, he treated those around him equally and with great respect. He never defrauded anyone. He never took what was not his. He was just. Solomon writes of the just that the tongue of the righteous or the tongue of the just is choice silver. Noah always had encouraging words for others. Noah's conduct, Noah's presence was uplifting to everyone around him. And his presence caused others to desire holiness. Genesis 6 verse 9 points out that Noah was perfect. Now many interpret this to mean that Noah was spiritually mature, but certainly not perfect in the true sense of the word. Who could ever say that any human being aside from Christ walking on this earth was perfect? Yet the Bible says that Noah was perfect. And I declare to you this afternoon that the Bible means what it says. The word perfect in the Hebrew is defined as complete, unscathed, intact, without fault, free of blemish. Now, the question I have for you is, the Bible defines Noah's character as one who was just and perfect, Yet those of you who are knowledgeable of the life of Noah in the context of the flood and after the flood, didn't Noah get drunk? <clears throat> didn't Noah get drunk? Mm -hmm. So do just and perfect people get drunk and expose themselves? Hmm. This poses a conundrum. A servant of the Lord writes that Noah was the most pious and holy upon 
of any upon the earth. However, in understanding that Noah was just and perfect, his justness and his perfection did not stem from what he did. It stemmed from who he knew. Noah was just and perfect because he knew the Lord. And just like every other stalwart in Bible history, their justification, their right standing with God, appearing as complete, unscathed, intact, without fault, free of blemish, came not from what they did, but from who they knew. They believed in the one spoken of in June 24, who says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Paul says in Romans 1 verse 17, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Therefore Noah, being just and perfect, was one who lived by faith. Paul writes, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Noah lived from faith to faith as Jesus Christ took possession of him. Noah willingly surrendered himself as a vessel. Noah willingly surrendered himself as a servant of Christ. And Christ lived out his righteous life in Noah and the text tells us that the righteousness of God was revealed through Noah as he lived from faith to faith. Many in the world live from breath to breath or from paycheck to paycheck. But the righteous live from <coughs> faith to faith. From faithful action of Jesus Christ to the next, next faithful action of Jesus Christ. The just are considered just and walk perfectly before God, not because of so much what they do, but because they keep their eyes fixed on the Savior. And as they keep their eyes fixed on the Savior, as the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Those who keep their eyes fixed on the Savior are covered with Christ's robe of righteousness. Therefore, when God looks down, He can justifiably say, When I am looking down on earth and I look down at Bob, I don't see Bob, I see Jesus. And when I see Jesus, I see perfection. I see someone who is unscathed. I see someone who is without blemish. When God looks down from heaven, when we are covered with the robe of righteousness, and He sees Claudine, He does not see Claudine, my wife. He sees Jesus. He sees the robe of righteousness covering my wife, and He says, I see perfection. Therefore, He can justifiably say that this person or that person is just and perfect. Not so much because of what they do, because of who they believe in. Noah lived before the time that the prophet Habakkuk penned the words, the just shall live by faith. Yet that is exactly how he lived. He was characterized as just and perfect because he lived by faith. In other words, Noah's faith was an active faith. It was a living faith. Hebrews 11 verse 7 tells us, By faith Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became the heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. When we speak of righteousness by faith, we are not speaking of unrighteousness by faith. 
In other words, Noah, prompted by the love of God, spurred by the love of God, was spurred, was motivated to do what God asked him to do. It wasn't something that he had to do. It was something that he wanted to do. And we'll come to that a little later. So the question that I have for you this afternoon is, are you covered in Christ's robe of righteousness? Do you have the joy of salvation welling up in your soul? One of the things that is most difficult for many to admit, especially I've noticed this in Adventism, is to say those words, I am saved. We are fearful, many are fearful of the once saved, always saved heresy. So, we want to stay away from those words. Yet the Apostle Paul speaks about the joy of salvation. He speaks about the assurance of salvation. We should have an understanding that if we are clothed, if we are covered with the robe of righteousness, and we're dealing honestly with ourselves, and when we fall, we confess our sins before our Father who loves us with an everlasting love, we are saved. And when Jesus comes again in the clouds of glory, like I read before in Jude 24, He will present us faultless before the presence of His glory. second character trait that Noah possessed is that he walked with God. The Bible tells us that not only was Noah just and perfect in his generations, but Noah walked with God. Those who find grace in the eyes of the Lord are characterized as companions of God. For we walk with Him and we talk with Him. And as the song says, He tells us we are His own. I serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. I know that He is living whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's what? Always. He's always near. Jesus lives. Jesus lives. Christ Jesus lives today. For He walks with me and He walks with you. And He tells us that we are His own. Noah walked with God. We are admonished to walk with God. Walking with God suggests closeness. When you're walking with someone, if this is the person I'm walking with, you could not say that I'm walking with someone if I'm this distance from the person, could you? I'm walking with someone if I am next to the person. So, when the Bible tells us that Noah walked with God, it speaks of an intimacy, a closeness that cannot be easily broken up. Noah was the Lord's close companion. And when we are the Lord's close companion, Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He reveals His secrets to His servants, the prophets. God longs to reveal His secrets to His servants. But we've got to be willing to accept His overtures of love and become His friends. Long before God was going to do something on the earth, but God said, before I do this dramatic thing on the earth, I've got to tell my friend Noah. I've got to tell him. And because of the relationship that I have with him, I don't even have to tell him. I know He will tell others and warn them about what I'm going to do on the earth. So as God communicated with Noah what He was going to do, Noah was, was sent out to sound a message of warning and mercy. So as walking not only suggests closeness, but it also suggests forward movement. Forward movement with an end point in mind, with a purpose. Not walking aimlessly. 
forward movement. Noah's walk with God was with the intention of glorifying Christ. Noah's walk with God was with the intention of having others come to the point where they would walk with God also. Noah longed for face-to-face -face communication. His ancestor Enoch, he knew about him. He was the first person in the Bible who was spoken of as someone who walked with God. And what happened with Enoch? That's right. The Bible tells us that Enoch walked with God and the Lord took him. And he was not. Although God loves everybody equally, so much so that he gave up his only unique son, God does not have the same closeness with everyone. There are not many people in the Bible who are called the friend of God. And the reason is not, the fault is not with God, the fault is with man. The reason is, is that there are many are called, but there are few that are chosen. There are few that accept the wooing voice, the loving overtures of God to walk with Him. Do you know that God begs us to walk with Him? Every, can you, every single morning when you're reminded to pick up your Bible, when you're reminded to pray, that's God begging us to walk with Him. Can you imagine the majesty of the universe, the creator of all the numerous galaxies, wants to walk with us, wants to walk with me as an individual, wants to walk with you as an individual? The reason why many are not called the friends of God is because they do not value the potential of a relationship with God. Or they do not even believe in God. Therefore, they do not experience that close-knit relationship that Noah experienced with God. The Bible tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What does this tell us? That Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What this tells us is that Noah sought for with all of his heart what was offered. Grace was as a hidden treasure in the ground and Noah sold everything. Noah gave up everything so that he could have that treasure called grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. <coughs> he sought it with all his heart. The Bible tells us, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I love this promise because the Bible tells us, Jeremiah tells us that we will, not we may. When we go on search for those missing keys, it's not a guarantee that we're going to find them. When we search for that missing wallet that perhaps fell in the crack between the, 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 the pillows of the couch, there's no guarantee that we're going to find it. But the Bible tells us that if we seek for God with all of our hearts, we will find Him. Amen? Amen. 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 Most people do not realize that what they truly want is to walk with God. In the time of the end, when the unjust see God, see Jesus in all His brilliance, in all His glory, they are going to gnash their teeth, not so much because of what they're missing out on the streets of gold, but because they themselves had been worshipping things or worshipping people who were nothing. They had an opportunity to spend time with the coolest, most amazing individual in the universe. But they kicked that opportunity aside. This is what will cause 
so many to gnash their teeth. So my friends, this morning, I invite you, I encourage you, see God with all of your heart and you will find Him. Amen. You will find Him. Luke 17 verse 26 says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. When considering this text, we often focus on the moral decay. We often, yeah, just as it was in the days of Noah, there was violence. Just as it was in the days of Noah, there was perhaps there was homosexuality that was prevalent. There was all sorts of evils and vices taking place. Yet have we ever given any consideration to the thought that the text is also pointing to that as it was in the days of Noah, there were very few who walked with God? So it will be in the days of the Son of Man. There are very few who choose to walk with God. Let us not be counted among those numbers. Let us be counted among the numbers of Hebrews 11, those champions of faith, of individuals who walk with God. It is not necessary for one person in this building to be found wanting on the day of judgment. Every one of us has an equal opportunity to enjoy a rich, lasting, fulfilling walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to accept Him or to accept Him again in your life. Genesis chapter 6 verse 22 says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. Genesis chapter 7 verse 5, I've mingled the two there, says, And Noah did all, did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Thus, the third character trait that Noah possessed was simple. He was obedient. As a result of his appreciation of being covered with Christ's robe of righteousness. As a result of his close walking with God, talking with God, communicating with God. It was as though he was floating above the earth. His walk with God produced a heart that was obedient to God's word. Once again, I say that it is not unrighteousness by faith, but it is righteousness by faith. Those who are covered in Christ's robe of righteousness will obey the Word of God. Someone said this morning, Psalms 119, 165, Great peace have those who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Again, Jesus said in His Word, If you love me, you will what? You will keep my commandments. The Bible has many examples of individuals who were obedient. They demonstrated, they, 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 they had the fruit, the evidence that they were walking with God. One example is Abraham, who we know as the father of the Jewish nation. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and what? <coughs> And he counted it to him for righteousness. The principle to understand is that if you look at all the stories of the great men and women in the Bible, is God made a ridiculous promise. God made a promise that sounded absolutely ridiculous, impossible. But they believed it. They believed it. Abraham was told that he would be the father of a great nation. Although he was approaching his hundreds and his wife was well past childbearing years. But they believed God and it took place. Mary. Mary was told that she would conceive a child without a man. 
This was impossible. This was ridiculous. Yet Mary believed God, and it was counted unto her for righteousness. Likewise, Noah. Noah was told something ridiculous. He was told that water is going to flood the earth. Water is going to flood the earth. At that time, we, we read in the pen of inspiration that it didn't rain during, during those times. They had never known what rain was. The earth was watered with dew. Therefore, the thought of water coming down from the sky was equivalent to pigs growing wings and flying. But you know what? Noah believed God. And it counted it to him for righteousness. And God makes the same promise to every one of us. He says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be wool. Amen. Though your sins be as scarlet. What is scarlet? Scarlet is red. God says, I am the God of the impossible. You will appear as white as snow. Do you believe it? As you face the challenges in your life, as you face the many defects in your character, as you recognize that sometimes you speak to your spouse the way that you shouldn't speak to your spouse, sometimes you speak to your children in ways that you shouldn't speak to them, thoughts cross your mind that you know shouldn't be there, sometimes you're compelled to watch things, listen to things that you know you shouldn't be looking at or listening to, Sometimes your behavior betrays that you are not a Christian or you are a Christian. Do you believe God's promise? Do you believe God's promise? God's ridiculous promise is for every one of us. As defective and as messed up as every one of us are, God promises each one of us Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Praise the Lord. So my question for you this morning is, have you found grace? Have you found grace? For if you have found grace, you are just and perfect. If you have found grace, you are walking with God. And if you have found grace... You are obedient. If you recognize that there are deficiencies that in your life and that you want Jesus to mold you into a person like Noah and then ultimately into a person like Jesus so that you can say confidently, praise God for making me just and perfect. Praise God that I have a rich, fulfilling walk with Him. And praise God that I see the fruits of obedience in my life. If you are that person and you recognize your deficiencies and you want me to pray for you this morning, I just want you to raise your hand. Praise God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the numerous examples in the Bible. Giants of faith. Men of faith, Father. And Father, it behooves us that we should be considered among the numbers of these great people. Joseph, Daniel, Noah, David, Father. Yet, Lord, we believe in the promise of your word. So, Father, I pray that you will forgive each one of us of our sins and that you will mold us into individuals so that we can say with confidence, not boasting in ourselves, but boasting in you, that praise God, we are just and perfect. Praise God, we are covered in Christ's robe of righteousness. Father, so that we can say that with confidence that yes, we are children of God. We are walking with God. That the Spirit of God will testify with our spirits that we are children of God. And Lord, 
that we would have hearts that are obedient. Hearts that love to do your bidding. Hearts that are not compelled to do your bidding because of fear of hell. But hearts that are compelled to do your bidding because of a ravenous love for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for doing all that you have promised in your word in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.